Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt. I'm uh, a chef. I work at Chef, and I'm going to be talking about bringing applications into the future with Habitat. Um, and so here we go. So Chef did a state of application delivery survey where we talked to almost 350 companies and talked to them about how they deliver applications into production. Uh, what we found is everybody wants to go faster. 72% of respondents said that. Uh, but we also found that most of them, it takes four to seven days to get that into production and multiple times to try. Um, we also found that people are trying to move to containers. About a quarter of the respondents said in two years, uh, half their workloads will be there. They're either going to rewrite them, 52%, or they're going to lift, shift, and modernize them. Lift, shift, and modernize. Well, we'll see how that goes. Um, and what we also found is that a lot of stuff's still on bare metal, uh, virtualization, containers, and some stuff's moving into serverless. And so how are they going to manage all this stuff going forward? Um, and the problem is most enterprises have what they call legacy applications. We call it things that are working in production. Um, and those applications, they come with a lot of stacks to them. You know, they're running on Windows 2003 or Red Hat 5, but they work and they're in production. Um, so I'm here to talk about Habitat. Habitat is an application automation framework from Chef. It's open source, uh, doesn't use Chef, but it helps modern application teams manage any application, building, deploying, and managing it, no matter where they go. It works for cloud native stuff. If you're talking about Docker, Kubernetes, Mesosphere, Cloud Foundry, it works with all those platforms, but today we're going to talk more about moving legacy applications because that's where the enterprises uh, are sitting. So when we talk about lifting and shifting, we're not talking about rewriting them. We're talking about taking them, picking them up off of Windows 2003 or 2008 or you know, Red Hat 5 and moving them onto newer platforms. Maybe it's containers, maybe it's just Red Hat 7. Uh, so the way, oh, formatting got a little wonky. Um, so the way Habitat works is there are build, deploy, and manage. Uh, we take a platform independent build of your application, package it up, allow you to deploy it to the platform of your uh, choice, and manage it consistently. When we build it, you have a plan. It's a bash script because you're writing stuff for Linux or PowerShell for Windows. You define how your application is built, what tools it uses, what versions of everything, and it produces a signed artifact that is reproducible. You always get the same build twice. Habitat's approach is to take your application and its runtime dependencies and isolate you from the OS so you're free to move to the platform of your choice, whether it's a newer version of Linux or Docker or Kubernetes. When we go to export it, we have a number of choices. You know, we can export to Docker, Mesosphere, uh, OCI, Cloud Foundry, um, you know, build packs, whatever, whatever the future may be, and then you can deploy it on bare metal containers, whatever it is that you like to use. Part of the Habitat uh, application is there's a process supervisor that can, you can use to manage your applications as they're running. It understands the configuration of your app, topologies they're deployed in, and upgrade strategies. That supervisor can subscribe to a stable channel or an unstable channel that's provided by the Habitat Builder. When my URL got cut off. Uh, the Builder pointed at source code, builds your application, produces those artifacts, and pushes it to a Docker registry or a stable channel or whatever you want, uh, where it, wherever you want it to go. So Habitat's approach for legacy modernization is let's separate your application away from the OS. Maybe you're going to package up that middleware, but we're going to isolate your applications from those platforms going forward. A uh, nice little story we have here is a customer of ours uh, had a, uh, uh, an application they wrote in, in 2002 for Windows 2003 written in Delphi in Portuguese, because you know everyone's got Portuguese. And so they picked that thing up, moved it into 2016 without rewriting it. Saved them $20,000 a year in licensing for Windows 2003. You got to pay extra for that. Developers, uh, they get any language they want, automatic builds on commit, explicit dependencies, and stable and non-channel promotions. Operators get a consistent packaging format for everything they do, consistent management of their applications, and CICD release channels. Uh, automated and, and built in. Hey, I actually caught up. Um, <laughs> and the, the benefits are, of course, uh, you're now free to choose the platform of choice going forward. You're not tied to legacy uh, operating systems, um, and you have a consistent approach for production, pre-production environments. Habitat, it's open source, does Linux, does Windows, lots of documentation and tutorials at habitat.sh. Source code's on GitHub, it's Apache licensed, Slack, forums, 2,000 people in there. Come check it out. Hi everyone, my name is Isha and 
I am a developer and an agile consultant and as those uh, I've had a lot of opportunity to talk to people about DevOps and what it means to them and uh, how they see it. This is me sharing my opinions on DevOps. So let's start with what I think DevOps is not. I've heard people say, oh yeah, I've set up CI pipelines before. I absolutely practice DevOps, but DevOps is not just about setting up CI pipelines. It's an important part of it, of course, but that's not all that it's about. At the same time, when I ask somebody, oh, so what kind of DevOps practices do, we, do you use? And they're like, oh, I use Jenkins and PCF and Docker and Kubernetes and XYZ. But again, that's not the practice. Those are aids. Those are tools you use to help you with that. When we think of DevOps, a large part of it does come down to provisioning servers and setting up environments, right? And that's true, that, that is a very important component of DevOps, but again, that's not all it is. You cannot say your DevOps practice is setting up environments. Like I said, the, DevOps is all of those things, but it cannot be like a lone cabin in the woods somewhere, right? This one client I was at, uh, we needed some pipelines created for a service we were uh, building, and we said, okay, who do we talk to? How does it work? They say, oh, there's this person in the next building, go talk to them. We go find the person, turns out they're on leave and we can't really reach out to them. Nobody knows when they're coming back and nobody else has context on what they were working on. So what this led to is what you'll see in just a second, a single point of failure, right? Which means that this one person has all the context required to set up pipelines and provision the servers we need. And if they're unavailable, what do we do? We just run around trying to find something that might really work. And another thing that happens is when we're doing estimations, a lot of the times estimations are done keeping the dev effort in mind, right? A lot of the times your ops teams are not involved right from the beginning. So you don't know that when you package something and throw it over the fence to them, you don't really know how long it'll take. Plus, a lot of companies have a few DevOps people that are uh, spread across multiple projects and which results in them trying to switch context very frequently and leading them to be thinly, thinly spread across the floor um, with that. Another big aspect is that when your DevOps people are not plugged into the day-to-day -day working of your teams, at that point, the teams have to tell them the requirements to a T. And there often is a two back and forth, oh, this doesn't work, maybe try this, okay, try that. That leads to an overhead. Let's talk about what DevOps instead is, right? It, just like anything else, it's a set of practices and shared beliefs that help with the smooth running of things. So it's a culture that you build within your teams. It's not a person, it's not a role. Similarly, it's not, it's not, like I said, it's not a person, it's not a role, it's a skill that anybody in your team can and should have. Sure, you can have people whose primary role is DevOps and the intricacies of it, but it should not be isolated to that person. Another thing is that as developers, we really like automating things, right? So when you think of DevOps, it is essentially development in ops. It's the automation of your ops practices and your ops requirements. So at the end of the day, it's essentially development. And it all boils down to feedback as a whole. You want to be able to get faster feedback on your release cycles, on your applications, on your environments, everything. So it's a constant cycle of creation and verification with a whole bunch of other supporting elements. Let's talk about what it means in a multidisciplinary agile team. So a multidisciplinary team to start with is a team of generalists where everyone has the skill to pick up and do a task that is needed to, for the smooth running of a team. So when it comes to DevOps, it's essentially about shared ownership. Earlier I talked about it not being a siloed role and not being a cabin in the woods. Here when we're talking about, we're saying everybody has the skill set required to be able to pick it up if needed. So that's what it comes down to. It's a, DevOps in itself is a set of overlapping skill sets. It's not one person, it's not one role, it's not one thing. It's development plus operations plus some quality assurance, all of that put together and called DevOps. I talked about development, DevOps being development earlier by using something like infrastructure as code and having, uh, using good coding practices with your infrastructure code, you'll have more reliable servers because you know that you can replicate things as and when needed with complete trust. Finally, communication, this is not in the sense of what I talked about earlier, it being an overhead, but that everybody is clued in and at all stages of your development practice, right from your business to your ops, and that's where, what it comes down to. 
Right, so that's all I had to say on DevOps and my opinion on it. I hope this gives you something to think about. And uh, if you'd like to chat further, I'll be around and happy to talk. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, hi, my name is Fabian. Welcome to my little story about the diary of DevSecOps kit. DevOps, DevSecOps, it's just a term, get over it. Um, what I'm trying to say is these are my opinions and jumping on the bandwagon of QR, you can scan it. Um, I used to work in uh, Intuit uh, two years ago. Uh, that was when this whole term of DevSecOps, DevOps uh, was kind of in, in, the, in the news and I was like, well, what was it about? So joining that company, I came to GovTech now, I'm working with GovTech. I am an engineer like the previous speaker, so those are my opinions. Uh, these are my opinions and some things are beyond me, right? The, the brain and the body has to control the legs and the arms which are us and we all move as a whole, that's DevOps. So I am a servant, uh, why? Because it's all about communication, it's all about asking others how things will work if we work together. It's not, I'm a security engineer by, uh, by, by, by trade, so, but I wouldn't say no, I would want to say yes, how are we going to move with DevOps? And DevOps, DevSecOps is akin to uh, Cyber Krav Maga, the, the thing cut off. Um, it's like self-defense, it's like you're punching yourself, you're training, you're inflicting pain to yourself, red teaming, all that, but why? Because at the end of the day, you want to make sure your whole system, you're well equipped when shit hits the fence. Excuse my French. But uh, working in the uh, public sector, it's kind of uh, interesting because stakeholders, right? At the end, we want to serve the public good software, but there are many layers of stakeholders. Uh, some of them are still slightly old school. It's okay. That's how they work. They're not entirely tech people. Uh, there are certain things and processes uh, in place for them to work. Outsourcing might be easier for them, but in our world where DevSecOps, DevOps would, would, would work, very fast, we get our control, we get all that. Uh, we, we do deal with priority in bite sizes, you know, this one to come first, so things change and time to remediate for us, we, we get to control that, right? When, when security bugs comes in and all that stuff, we get to fix that first. So of course, uh, everyone has different concerns, not all of them are tech related, uh, can be legally related, can be socially related, but uh, DevSecOps tries but cannot solve everything. So at the end of the day, we want to remember that we, want, we are serving the public uh, good software, yeah, GovTech, uh, open source, everything. We, work, we focus on the small wins. We try to you know, make sure that everyone is accepting to our f experiments and little failures we have because these are your monies, taxpayers. <laughs> but we won't fail too much. Yeah? Um, so another topic that I would like to talk to about is um, shifting left uh, by you know, shifting your organization. Uh, so this is a typical org chart. Um, so like product A, B, and C has different, uh, different teams, but security sometimes will be outside of the, the, the team. And everyone now wants security to be in the team, right? And this can be good. Well, it's a shared resource you can scale, but what I've seen so far is that everyone wants security um, engineers to be in the team, right? It's kind of like flat. Uh, like what um, the previous speaker has said, uh, everyone gets a DevOps uh, engineer, and then we get spread too thin. But of, of course, we have the ability to fix things if we are in the team, in the development team. Um, of course, a hybrid model would be better. You have someone who oversees all the operations as well as you inject people in each individual team as security uh, engineers or consultants, but that comes at a high cost. Well, security is everyone's responsibility. I think some of you may, may have heard this many, many times. Uh, well, I've, I'm going to say it again because it is. It's not someone else's responsibility, but my responsibility. Uh, and Scrum, <laughs> but I, I just, never mind. I used to do this in like 15 minutes, now I'm like five seconds. But what is Scrum? Scrum Masters, Kanban, mixed together. Why? Because uh, when you're doing development, you're feature focused, but dealing with security, they come in as an ad hoc type of work, right? It interrupts your, your uh, feature requests and sprint requests. So what we did in uh, Nectar, in GovTech, is that we have a support role who shield the other developers. So this support role would actually go out and resolve all the operations and all the security incidents while the rest of us can actually develop on the features. So and another thing about uh, DevSecOps is that we have red teaming. Like It's like Cyber Krav Maga, you, you know, inflict pain or you, you test your infrastructure, you uh, load test and all that stuff. And all these are uh, pushing boundaries, right? The culture has shifted. Uh, it used to be that don't, don't touch anything, production, no, don't, don't move it. But now we, we, we want to transform, it's everyone's uh, you know, commitment, engineers and non-engineers, right? Those facing the business, clients, support, everyone. 
So thank you for listening to me. I don't, I know I talk pretty fast, but yeah, scan QRs. I, I know everyone loves QRs. <laughs> Divya here. I am a senior product manager in Microsoft Azure. Uh, Azure DevOps is our tool for helping you do complete operation lifecycle management, uh, your software management from ideation to code versioning, build, deploy, test, everything of that. What I'm going to talk about is uh, testing, being key part of DevOps. Now, DevOps helps you increase, and some mind-boggling numbers from Dora there. Uh, deployment um, and failure, reduce failure rate. But what about testing? People don't talk about that. Uh, there is a report again from Forrester which says if you concentrate on testing, can I move it? Okay, if you concentrate on testing, it helps you again uh, increase and get the feedback faster and help get feedback and improve your dev DevOps. Uh, look at the right matrix instead of how many tests. Look at how is the coverage. Uh, what requirements are you covering well? Now, if I look at what we were in Microsoft were doing, we had really long running tests so with nightly builds, which would take 22 hours, and obviously the feedback time reduces. We didn't have our master healthy. Uh, green or red was not actually red. So, like one of the lessons learned was if you say nightly build, it, the test will turn, take uh, all night to run, like we had. So, there were a few changes that we did uh, to help improve. And there were changes uh, like people have talked about in the organization which we built, which is combined engineering. That is, the folks who develop code also write their tests as well as deploy their code. So that ownership comes to one single team, and we've heard this since uh, in various sessions in the day to day, um, is combined engineering, um, which helps you bring that ownership. Test becomes the framework or the design pattern to understand how's my code doing, bring that traceability. And that brings to the next lesson learned, which is test <coughs> closer to your code. Uh, when you're writing code, even bring in your unit test with it. We in Microsoft have, um, like for Azure DevOps, our product, we have 82, 83,000 tests running as part of our PR. And if those tests don't pass, the PR itself doesn't get committed to master. Um, so you're responsible for test and define a common terminology. What we have is L0s, which are the unit test, L1s, which are a little long running and does your unit test with DB, L2s, which is actually your functional test, and L3s, which are end-to-end -end production test. And we run these tests in our pipeline across the board. So some of the things from a quality vision, move shift left, that is, move your test and move them from L0 to your L1s and L2s and in your pipeline. Um, so this is what I was talking about, pull request, then your CI pipeline, your pre-production stages and production as well. So we run tests in productions as well, which again is the best place to understand the test that you've, sorry, the code that you've just shipped, how well is it behaving. Left uncontrolled, and if you don't manage your test code as good as you manage your feature code or your dev code, you don't have reliability. Like you can't have flaky test or you can't treat red as not red or sometimes it fails and sometimes it's okay uh, and can't have a reliable system. So you need to give as much focus to that as um, your dev code. And like I said, there's no place like production, test in production as well and get matrix to have your DevOps cycle and have that feedback. Overall, look at the matrix for your test as well. So over in the pipeline, how's my test health doing? What's my overall SLA? Um, how long are the tests taking to pass and things like that? Lastly, um, don't you, you can't be perfect, but if you focus on the right things, you can have a bigger radius of blast. Um, the last one is the key lessons learned. Accountability, that is the combined engineering, which brings the accountability of the code. L0s, L1s, the trunk-based uh, development requires faster testing, test as code, as well as 
bring in the matrix to help you monitor your uh, tests. So thank you. Good afternoon. Myself Shivin from Oracle Asia Research Development Center. So our team focused mainly on identifying the new and innovative technologies for the customers in APAC region. So today I am, I am here for telling you a story from my last experience from Oracle India, like identifying the list candidate build for CI's continuous delivery model. So this is Agile world. So we all follow any of the Agile methodology for the product development. So we all know that it's fast, it's less failure and more feedback loop. And also we all adopt DevOps culture and practice. So this makes the stakeholders, the QA, project managers, and everyone happy. So did I miss any particular team or group from this list? Yes, they are list engineers. So they are a small team in your organization that will be affected in continuous delivery model. So it's a tedious task for them to identify a qualified one release candidate build from a bunch of qualified builds. So let me give you more example from my experience. So we are following Scrum methodology and we have around 19 Scrum teams. And the contribution of these 19 Scrum teams makes the product as such. And it's a multi-gate project and the team members are from different geolocations. So as you can see in the image, a great pipeline. We also have a good pipeline. So whenever a developer commits a code, it reaches to different testing phases and it needs to qualify different gates. So these gates are auto-configured till it reaches to the acceptance test. So we all know that acceptance test is a set of valid rules or procedures that a build need to qualify for reaching to the production environment. So the acceptance criteria will vary from company to company or from organization to organization based on your requirements. So let's see the acceptance criteria for our, so our acceptance test should be greater than or equal to 90 percentage. So this is the aggregate pass percentage of 19 scrum teams and all the individual scrum teams should be greater than 80 percentage and smoke test should pass and there should not be any self zero or self one on the release period. So we are doing our weekly release to the customer and we have around 4,000 UA test cases and it takes around two hours to complete the acceptance run. So based on this, we are getting around 12 builds per day and considering in a week of five working days, we are getting around 60 builds. So I am considering a 10 percentage of error. This may be due to any environment issue or anything related to Scrum. Still, we have 54 valid builds for that particular weekly release build. So here comes the release engineer. He need to pick one build from the 54 builds and consider that as a release candidate engineer. Which one he need to pick? whether it's the last one, first one, or middle one. So in our case, not only that, the release engineer need to deploy the release identified build in another environment and run smoke test on top of it. Not only that, he need to notify the stakeholders and the rest of the team members regarding the weekly build and its details. So let's see the challenges of this. As we all know that, know that it's a manual process, so always a manual process may end up with a lot of errors and it's a time consuming. As I mentioned earlier, it's a multi-git repo project. There are a lot of confusions are happening between the Scrum members and the release engineers. So developers don't know whether their code changes will reach the production on this week or next week. So considering these challenges, what will be the solution for this issue? So we got the solution from the last year hackathon. It's an internal event for our organization. So the solution is none other than a configurable dashboard. So what's that? A configurable dashboard is a dashboard where the release engineers can able to log in and map their acceptance criteria on the dashboard. And we have created a custom object in our product that can hold all the characteristics of acceptance run. That means whenever an acceptance is running, that will push the pass percentage, fail rate, how many builds are there, what's the time taken, everything is pushed to the database. And we introduced a ranking system Based on that, at any point of time, there will be one build will be ranked as one, and that will be highlighted in green in color. So coming to the features of this dashboard, this dashboard give a feature for release engineers to run or deploy the rank one build from this to the separate environment, and they can able to run smoke test on top of it. And also it give a lot of other features like in a next click, the build will reach the customer environment and also give a auto notification to the stakeholders. So let's say about the benefits. This gives a better feedback loop between the release engineers and the rest of the Scrum team members. And also more than that, it gives a level of automation in continuous delivery projects. And that makes the release engineers happy. Thank you.